In 1999, four professors at the Combat Studies Institute in the United States met to discuss World War I from the perspective of military history. Now, on HistoryRadio.org, an edited recording of that event. To earn you freedom, the seven-pillared worthy house that your eyes might be shining for me when we came. Death seemed my servant on the road. Lawrence of Arabia. talking about World War One and discussing some approaches and also trying to give you some information uh, in terms of what does World War One mean overall and maybe give you some pointers. We have our work cut out for us. Yeah, yeah, I think we do. I don't know for a thing that I, I one of the biggest problems with teaching World War One, in my opinion, is his spell the sort of the myths and, and the, the stereotypes are associated with the war. And when you when you mention World War One student it is will tend to say, well, it's all stupidity. The generals were stupid, and the guys went over top again and again, and the machine guns, it was mud and trenches, and that's all I need to know. Uh, and that's that's a, that's a hurdle that instructor's going to have to get past. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing to be learned from it, because it's just a, a, a glaring example of military stupidity. Mm -hmm. Well, there's plenty of that involved, too, but there's a lot, lot more to it as well. Uh, there's another problem you might have, Teaching war, and there'll be a lot of people who want to talk about the origins of peace because that's what general historians like to talk about. You know, what led to the war, the causes of it, and also his general historians will like to talk about what came out of it, the important things, whether it's the Russian Revolution, America's emergence as a world power, uh, the destruction of the monarchies in Europe, for example. In the military history course, we need to focus, and you, you're not to push your students, I believe, into looking at the military developments in that that period and we all uh, have seen this slide i like to use a slide uh at, at the end of uh teaching world one where james C. full of famous british military historian says there were more changes that were more different from the period between 1914 and 1918 than it had during the entire previous century and that sort of causes the eyebrows to come up and say what we go on here we, we go from at the tactical level of war uh mass formations direct fire artillery uh, a lot of officers still contemplating the use of mounted force cavalry. Buildings. Very, very limited role for aviation, if any at all. To by the end, we're kind of going backwards. Aviation has developed every one of the roles that it will eventually fulfill down the route. The mounted arm is already appearing to be tanks and armored cars. Um, artillery has gotten very complex in firing indirect fire rules. It's a about a very much a three-dimensional battlefield and infantry is now performing much like infantry does today you know, very dispersed very open order squad level maneuvering and that's really where this lessons readings focus more than anything else is at the strategic level a lot of things change there. Is it? Mm -hmm. so i think maybe the, the approach to take is to discuss change how do armies change especially how do armies change in the crucible of a tremendous conflict mm -hmm. which is getting very high. Mm -hmm. How do you go about choosing which way to change? One one caveat, though, we must keep in mind, and that clearly is that uh, what is obvious to us was not obvious to the commanders and to the national leaders in 1915, 1916. Before we're too harsh on them, mm -hmm. we must keep in mind that we have now a uh, 75-year perspective on those mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's easy for us to condemn them as being blind, foolish, anachronistic, uh, yeah. any number of other terms that we wish, might wish to apply to them. But uh, they were working within the context of how they understood warfare. Mm -hmm. So let's not judge them uh, too harshly. Yeah. They probably thought of themselves also as being very well educated. They were. And uh, forward thinking. And they were. So... Uh, it, we're going to have some difficulty attempting to put them into their perspective. Your job as a facilitator 
is to get your students to talk intelligently about the readings that they've had for this week and hopefully to link some of the uh, the readings for lesson to lesson. In light of this, uh, I would suggest approaching the lesson chronologically, opening up in the same manner with the Schlieff Clifford, their plans, their vision of mm -hmm. on for allies and the and the central powers, how they thought the war would go, how combats would go, and then the ugly the ugly reality of combat. Mm -hmm. um, and getting to 1918 and trying to escape. Mm -hmm. So that that's that's how I would approach. Yeah, I think it's a nice link with the last lesson is is to open up with. Uh, you might want to briefly review one of the causes, but you can't get, get locked into that. But to say what kind of war did they expect, and how does the, how does the Schlieffen plan answer the German problem? Why did they need a plan like that? It's the most famous war plan, in, arguably the most famous war plan in history. And I having the students discuss. What is it? Uh, is it a work of genius that some some people uh, consider it to be, or is it something fatally flawed that that uh, set Germany up for a catastrophic failure? Uh, Describe uh, how it went and then how it eventually broke down. I uh, think all things that students uh, yeah, can spend some worthwhile discussion time on. I I would agree. Um, a fascinating piece of the story, um, in a lot of ways, are all of those attempts. Um, really in 1916 and 1917 to figure out, okay, we've got this can of worms and how do we put them back in there? For those of us who are, are thinking about new technologies being introduced today and how they will influence mm -hmm. the military of tomorrow, uh, it will probably be instructive to examine how some of these technological wonders of World War I mm -hmm. were introduced and the process of how institutions receive these items. But the pieces of World War One that are most important for American military history is one, just America entering the world stage through root power. And second, what we learn about mobilization mm -hmm. in this modern age. Yeah. Because the American combat experience is very, very, very brief. Yeah. It, in effect, is we're all we're players, big players on on the Western Front, really about the last three months of the war. And European sources will tend to tend to downplay it. You'll have students in the class who will say, "Hey, we want to talk about the American experience. We want we'd like to get into that more." If you got to do that, that's going to be up to the instructor to carry it because there's there's not much in a lesson that, that will let you work with that. A couple things that I think are worth highlighting. Uh, what you make. What is the mobilization experience? What are the problems we have? Uh, how do we overcome them? How do we perform on the battlefield? Uh, what, what compromises do we make with our allies? These are all things that, that are worth talking about. But if you're going to do that, you're going to, uh, you're going to have to carry it on your own. I, I think a point worth making is, uh, uh, it is, uh, I'd argue, one of the great force, maybe the greatest force projection operation in history at that point. And two million Americans over uh, to the Western Front by the end of the war, and your students may tend to say, "Well, yeah, that's it's the Americans then that win World War One." I I would tend to disagree with that. So I the yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Little Hart's point. That, well, the Americans didn't win the war, but they guaranteed the Allies would win the war. Yeah. Uh, no, they guaranteed the Allies wouldn't lose the war, but perhaps and they should. <laughs> they should agree with too. Yeah. Uh, I think the the uh, ultimate. Uh, Conclusion is what we're still in doubt as of, of the spring of 1918. Summer of 19. Yeah. Well, maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe the right question is uh, one of those reading questions mm -hmm. on the on the sex page, which is where are we at in the evolution of modern warfare? And you can use the American example. Well, that's that's part of the answer in that question. Mm -hmm. but, but clearly, most of the focus is on most of the readings deal with the other. I mean, uh, European nations. On the other hand, in the sweep of this course, you're now getting to a period where some of the students will know something beyond what they have read specifically for this course. Yeah. Uh, many of them have little or no knowledge about uh, 19th century European institutions and warfare, yeah. but uh, they've all had something, yeah. however... Uh, that not important it may have been focusing on the American aspect of this war in their high school or their college history courses. And I, I think that's an that's an important point. I like to have my students see new and different perspectives of 
not just World War One, but the other lessons too. Mm. And I use two essays in his studies in battle coming in. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, I ask for volunteers. Uh, one each to uh, brief on and two essays. One um, on page 87 by Dr. George Gavrich called The Rock of Gallipoli. I'm not Camille Additor, the Battle of Gallipoli. And on uh, page 97, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Silverstone's essay on um, General Monash in the Battle of Hamel, in which the Aust Australian army goes on the offensive against the Germans in 1918. One of the themes I like to, to get get into the discussion right away, it's something that all, all students ought to be able at least have an opinion on, is his relation of, of political and military leadership. And the sleeping plan allows you to get into that. This is this is arguably the first uh, total war in history. Uh, and the civilian leadership expected the military people to have answers. Uh, though no one had ever ever really mobilized an entire society and, and, and got into a war that, that drew on every aspect of society, that, that tested every aspect of society, it's social, economic, political institutions, and uh, Craig would Craig would suggest that uh, civilian leadership expected a, a little too much of the military people. Sleep plan is a good vehicle because uh, when you got down to the nuts and bolts of what was going on, the political leadership in Germany didn't know what the detail really meant. What uh, the, even the broad points of the sleep plan, they didn't understand that. And uh, as, as the train started moving, all of a sudden they found themselves in a situation they couldn't call it back, this, this thing that they had unleashed. And it, it's worth asking, you know, I mean, sort of a shameless poet uh, to, get, to draw relevance out of this course, what are the responsibilities of civilian leaders in understanding uh, how the military operates, how they plan? To, uh, to return to Craig's essay, uh, we have three different governments, right? Uh, in England, France, and Germany, they were all faced the same dilemmas, and none of them do too well. Okay. If, if the uh, civilian governments expect too much from the civilians, it may be because, or from the military, maybe because the military misled them uh, in, in what they could expect. Mm. Or perhaps, perhaps has too much prestige in, in, uh, in society. Oh, right. She's a uh, too great a role in, yeah. in decision-making process. Yeah. Well, it, it begs the question, I think, uh, how much should the political leader know about military affairs? Uh, I, I, in another example, for, in uh, late 1916, you have a German government. The German Navy comes in with a chart that says, we can win the war in five months if you just let us unleash our U-boats. What's a political leader supposed to say in that? In that okay, what, how does he respond with a, with a technical expert can lay it out chapter and verse and PowerPoint slides that, hey, I've got the answer right here? Um, in the Craig article, they point out that Clemenceau had a military advisor who could whisper in his ear, hey, boss, I think the general is forgiving you a line here. There's a, an interesting analogy that, that you kind of mentioned when you were talking about the sleeping plan and the, and the civilian reaction once that whole process began. And that is that, that one of the most important books in the early 1960s was uh, Barbara Tuchman's The Guns of August. And it, that had a tremendous impact on uh, American uh, political and military thinking at the beginning of the 1960s. Uh, because it was similarities and seen a lot of uh, ways between the mobilization system that these countries used and they're kind of on ballistic missiles. But once you order mobilization, you either have to go all the way through with the attack mm. or you leave yourself mm. naked as you try to, to stop the mobilization as the trains will be confused and units will be in the right mm. place and you will essentially be defenseless. And if you launch ICBMs and you decide, oops, we made a mistake, you can't call them back. The only thing you can do is destroy them in midair. And at that point, once again, you're laying their defenseless in front of a still armed enemy. Mm -hmm. So those analogies had a tremendous impact on the Anna Kennedy administration. And that, that might be another way to draw out the relevancy of this whole thing again. That, you know, World War One didn't really end in 1918. In terms of the military aspect, again, you got to come back to what's the problem that the generals face after the war plans fail? What do you do now? Yes. And this is the test of all military institutions. And Michael Howard's famous essay hey, whatever doctrine you you go into a war with, you're going to find it wanting in some way. It's not going to pass the test in all accounts. So the trick is to develop the mental flexibility and uh, the versatility that says, okay, I've seen the test of battle now. Here's how I'm going to change. In a parallel, on the face of it, you've got every army, major army in the world, doesn't pass the test. 
So where else do we go here today to try and help these folks out? Well, there are a couple points I'd like to make about the, the, the trench warfare piece again, which is a lot in most students' mind. This is what World One's about. The war didn't happen exclusively on the Western Front. There's fighting in China between Japanese and Germans in their colonies. There's fighting in, in Af East Africa that goes on the entire war. In the 1919, yeah. in fact. Well, there's uh, naval naval fighting off the coast of Chile and the Falkland Islands. There, there is, uh, of course, you move campaigns across. Uh, they're proliferating into the Indian Ocean. The British Army is surrounded and surrenders in Baghdad. Yeah. Or Baghdad. Yeah. 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 Uh, it, it is a world war. But coming back to the Western Front, it's it's more than guys feeling uh, really in the barbed wire and getting shut down by machine guns. As early as, as 1915, uh, armies are starting to figure out the first part of the problem. Uh, that is, yeah, there's a three part problem. So often we say it's just, not only do you have to break into the enemy trench system, which is going to be deep uh, by the end of the war, very sophisticated. You've got to break through the trench system and break out of the, the trench system. And I said as early as 1915, they'd figured out the first part of that. As 16 and 17 come along, they're figuring out the second part of it, but it's not until 1918 that people have figured out really the third part. How do you break into, break through, and then break out of a trench system out into the enemy's rear area? And even then, uh, exploiting the successes you have, something that eludes them is going to wait to. But you exploit in World War One. You, you don't have the technological capability. Um, if, if you think about the problem as one of movement, of the attacker become real bad as you look at World War I. First, you've got the area of your own trenches pounded by the artillery for a couple of years. So it's a mess. Then you've got no man's land full of uh, craters and, and you know, leftover gas and barbed wire and all kinds of fun fight. Not the best place in the world to move across. You've got the enemy's trench system. It's not a yeah. single trench. It... You as the attacker have to cross no man's land. Mm -hmm. Cross the enemy's trench system and then try to break out yeah. through all of this difficult country. And the only way you can do that basically is on foot. I draw it to the students if you're a brigade commander in a battle, say like the Somme, and you see the first wave go over the top and then disappear over the reverse slope, how do you make the decision to send the follow up? Do you send the second wave and third wave? You know, how do you make those kind of decisions? Uh, again, we, we tend to think it was stupid without looking at the, the, the real limitations they had to work with. It's, it's a tough the, situation. The, the killing technology is virtually the killing technology of today. Mm -hmm. the communications and command and control and technology is not that. Century. It's his 19th century. Yeah. And that, that yeah. provides a real difficult problem for these guys to work out. Yeah. I'm not part of, about the Western Front, you know, getting to, to get past the machine guns and blowing guys down and far apart. Uh, you have millions of so There are other fronts going on, as I said before. In the Russian Front, you have, uh, if you have millions of troops involved, but because of the, the, the sheer size of the space involved, that front moves back hundreds of miles throughout the war. They don't have this, the stagnant trench systems. What it is on the Western Front, a lot of technology is just the sheer density of troops. As you point out, you can break into the enemy's trench system, but he has reserve formation behind reserve formation behind reserve formation ready to move up and plug the gap. Uh, that's the other piece. You know, the world has never seen armies that size thrown together from the English Channel down to the Swiss border. We didn't even you know, repeat those loggers in World War II on the Western Front. Um, you know, this didn't really approach you know. Uh, the, the British and French and Americans are pushing, what is it, 200 divisions combined by the end of the war mm -hmm. on the Western Front. Okay. And, you know, in, in World War II, if I remember right, between the British and Americans, there, there's like 80 and 90 total. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But, you know, um, so the density of forces is, is another significant factor. Right. Well, we also have to keep these various uh, fronts in perspective. The reason we talk so much about the Western Front is this, is this is where we find the origins of later World War II and after World War II doctrine. Do you want to talk a little bit about World War I aviation? Of course, uh, there were uh, airplanes prior to uh, World War I. Uh, we all know the story of the uh, Wright brothers and uh, for a decade, uh, there have been air forces uh, of a sort being uh, developed, so them uh, more vigorously than, than others. Uh, but it was uh, certainly the war itself 
that gave the impetus to a lot of uh, experimentation and development of, uh, of the aircraft as an integral weapon of war. We, uh, we see this specifically in the case of uh, France, Germany, Britain, uh, Italy, which are the most uh, progressive in developing their air arms. The United States is uh, uh, extremely slow for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's a small army. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, resources available to uh, put a lot of money into air development. Uh, even in the uh, expedition down on the Mexican border in 1916, it's almost a pathetic use of the American airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, there are some very progressive, forward-looking uh, people uh, in, in all countries who uh, make claims, sometimes claims that cannot be uh, lived up to by the level of technology at that time, but that provides a cutting edge. And it does, in fact, uh, bode well for the future of aviation because, uh, as uh, stated earlier in our session here, everything that you will see uh, in World War II in aviation is available in some nascent form during World War I, and, uh, beginning with, uh, with observation and scouting, uh, bombing, strategic bombing, interdiction, close air support, and of course, uh, air to air combat. And all of that is, is available. And, and by, uh, by 1918, uh, uh, this, uh, arm has been transformed from, uh, a, a very, very primitive, uh, weapon into something that is quite sophisticated. Uh, obviously what will happen later on is, uh, tremendous advances in technology, uh, power, Plants will improve, airframes will become stronger, heavier, uh, ranges and altitudes will grow, but basically uh, all the missions that we will see later mm -hmm. uh, are, are, are being developed. Uh, uh, and, and surprisingly enough, uh, some of the people doing experimentations are people who later on will not have such a major role. The Italians are very progressive in their, their aviation industry. The Russians are doing a lot of innovative kind of things even though they have very limited uh, resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, and once again, because of uh, a few specific individuals who have made a significant mark on uh, the uh, future of military aviation, we tend to look at the Western Front. Mm -hmm. That's not the only place that uh, mm -hmm. military aviation is uh, is developing at this time. Mm -hmm. the, on the Italian front, as you mentioned, there's some, some option German bombing with Italian cities and, and the Zeppelins appearing over London cars and, and the, in both places, some brief panic that let the explosive air power later on say, hey, here's the key toward winning a war like this, is go over the trenches and crack civilian morale. All of the, the big names in World War II military aviation will uh, appear on the scene in 1917-1918. Uh, Due is uh, beginning to formulate his ideas, which he will write down later on. Yes. They appear to be court martial. Whoa. Well, they, they have their problems. They have their problems. But, uh, yeah. oh, but guys right. like oh, Trish sure. and Harris, all of these guys are uh, getting their uh, their baptism of aviation fire, as it were, yeah. perhaps, and, and perhaps beginning to uh, to build empires. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Mitchell, of course, uh, although he's not a major player, he is much larger in retrospect than he was at the time, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly gathering up his uh, little bag of tricks, which he will then come home uh, and uh, and unleash. He's a showman even during during World War One, and he will continue that uh, uh, that trait uh, later on. So all of these guys we will see later uh, in the interwar period and in World War Two. Uh, are, are all uh, learning something about their trade, mm -hmm. uh, in the, especially in 1917, 1918. Hard to watch things. Can we recommend uh, perhaps having a, uh, a student volunteer to, uh, to refund some aspect of the war scene? Um, yeah, I would think so. There are two, two pretty critical aspects of the war and scene. Uh, the first one is the, the patently obvious uh, submarine war. Yeah. Well, and again, they have the, the, the Admiral have the same problem. General have they put they had all anticipated a war where, where big fleets with big guns, battleships, and duke it out the line of battle, and that happens one time uh, indecisively. Yeah, indecisively. Uh, the real key to the war at sea is, is the new weapons on the scene. 
uh, torpedo boats, the submarines, the mines, mines, um, the sea control kind of thing. But there's the there's the submarine piece or the problem of Britain in how the Britain supplied. Uh, the Germans have some very successful surface raiders. Hunt them down, but it takes some tremendous resources to do so. It's a big ocean. Uh, they're hard to find. Uh, you have to put an awful lot of ships to sea to find that one little ship out there that's creating a lot of mischief and mayhem. Mm -hmm. Right. But then there's the submarine issue. So if here's this new weapon that is not only pretty lethal, but it, it hides pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, how do you fight it? What's the what's the strategic level response to the submarine? I do go to convoying. You know, your history for you know 250 years has said the price of convoying is too high. Because if the bad guys get into the convoy, they're going to take it out. You don't want more, right? And then there's the technical aspect, the technological piece in. So that's the one area that, that students could explore. Right. Can I pick up on that? It, some folks even suggest, though, that the, the dilemma, the U-boats themselves, the limitations, uh, cause some, some tough problems. If you're going to use them, uh, you means you don't have to violate the, the established practice of, of naval war. Do we risk bringing America into the war in early 1917? You have a war plan that will bring Britain in, okay? If you're going to fight Britain, you're going to have to have U-boats. To make them effective, you're going to have to use unrestricted submarine warfare, and then again, you run the risk of bringing America in. Again, it's a sleeping plan, or it's a fix. Come back. After the year of 1916, though, when clearly we saw the effects of attrition, mm -hmm. uh, the United States uh, had its great many problems with its industrial mobilization, and uh, it's possible to argue that the Germans take a reasonable risk, like any risk, sometimes sure, it fails. Well, it's, I'm, I'm not well, I'm the general staff. I'm all looking at the American Army in, in late 1960. I got 200 divisions on the Western Front and, and a million men in the East. I'm not sure that I, I can I can worry too much about these guys. This, this <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, think it's, I think it's a reasonable risk that the Germans take. Well, not only that, but they come fairly close. In Britain, in five off. weeks of starvation, five weeks of supplies yeah. left. We talked about the American contribution to the war. Uh -huh. And you know, the psychological aspect begins to play in 1918. But America may very well have contributed one of the most significant decisions to winning World War I in 1917. When the British ask for American naval help, mm -hmm. she's a more sea, and the Americans say, we'll be happy to give you help, but we're going to start convoying. And that was the Americans' immediate reaction to the war situation. Admiral Sims in London said, you know, this single ship sailing stuff, you know, he's in work as we have to go to convoy. And it was heat of Russia and the pressure of the American government that, that you know, convinced the British to do it. Well, Lloyd George. Well, yeah, Lloyd George said, but it was when the American Navy came in and, and really weighed in with the Royal Navy that, that the Royal yeah. Navy folded. Well, and Navy, and our Navy by its very nature was more prepared to go to war than the Army was. Yes. Since we have always relied up until this time on our Navy as our first line of defense, mm -hmm. the Navy was much closer to mobilization yeah. status. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. therefore, we could put so the Navy. Well, mm -hmm. but so did the Brits and, and everybody else. But, but the thing is, uh, we, were, we were more ready to go to war at sea than we were to go to yeah. war on land. Um. But the Royal Navy doesn't fight the battle it, it, it isn't dreamed of. The Jutland is just almost a, a few old. opening rounds. It's it's not a real fleet to fleet fill up action. All we're in a hang. They're they're structured for these grand climactic battle. And they never pull it off. But what is the rule of the, of the Royal Navy in the First World War? If you, if you buy a little art, it's decisive. Absolutely, because what it does is it enforces the blockade on Germany. And in the end, it's the blockade in Germany that brings the whole house of cards down. You can argue that, yeah. That's yeah, that's, that's, that, that's a, Well, I, that, would, that's, that would tie out something I need. I think you need to talk about looking at uh, Sarah Moon's article about 1916. Why 1916 is pretty clear you're not going to win uh, the, achieving decisive results in a neat Napoleonic bat, uh, battlefield result that lead to a quick victory. It, that's, that's not going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. So how do you win a war like that? Uh, one solution, uh, the German solution, we're done as well. This is, this is going to be a war of attrition. We'll fight attrition battles that'll lead to, the, to, uh, to taking selected enemies out of the war. 
you could criticize a German Falcon Eye, the guy who dreams it up. You criticize look what a butcher he is. On the other hand, you could argue this is the guy who first sees clearly what kind of war you're in. It's a war where you have to bleed the enemy death because you're mobilizing entire societies. Single battles aren't going to get it. Uh, we're going to have to come up with a strategy that uh, allows us to, to take out armies. Uh, annihilation ain't going to work uh, to fall widely uh, if you buy that uh, annihilation versus attrition. We're going to have to accept attrition and know what's the best way to fight attritional war. Coming back to you, the Royal Navy said, yeah, we know how to fight an attrition war. We'll starve about it. Falkland says well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna kill enough of them in this case Frenchmen that they will have to give up. Right. This is a critical point in tying the lessons of World War One together with the future uh, lessons of this, and that is in World War Two, uh, the French and the British neither one can stand to fight a war of attrition, mm -hmm. and that has a tremendous impact on how that war is going to be fought. So there's a direct bridge here between these. Battles, these attrition battles of 1916, and, and what happens in 1940 in France. Another uh, issue is the rule of coalition warfare. When, uh, when the uh, French are on the ropes in Verdun and screaming for help, um, the Russians reach awful deep down in the well and pull up the Buslov offensive to help them out. And at the same time, uh, the French are having problems with Verdun, but they have this major offensive plan with the uh, Kitchener's new armies of Putin. Um, and, you know, what's the relationship going to be between those two events? And how does that, you know, how does that, that sort of stuff interact? Um, not quite as much of a, a coalition effort between the, the Germans and the Austrians, because you can probably dig into that a little bit. Well, I like. I think the coalition issue is one that you can make a lot of miles in you your article and also the Craig article. What what, do, what do coalitions give you uh, on the positive side? Numbers. Uh, well, they, they give you they give you help when you're when you're in dire straits. And the first major power to go out of the war is Russia in nineteen seventeen. They're the one major power that doesn't have somebody that can come to their rescue. You know, if it's France, you can have the British attacking at the Somme. If, if you're the Austrian, you can have the Germans bailing you out again and again. But Russia doesn't have that help, and significantly, they're the first guys to get knocked out of the war. On the downside, coalition partners can call, can really, really put a corset on your strategic options. Uh, one example is the Russians going to go on the offensive in 1914, long before they're fully mobilized and ready to go. And, and one, of the, one of the outcomes of that possibly is the, the fiasco at Tannenberg. You have the British uh, launching at Somme, arguably before they're ready to go, and reaping some horrible results of that because the French are in such dire straits for done. You have the the failed attempt at Gallipoli to try to get aid to the to the Russians, uh, and, and operation with a, with a lot of potential, but but it doesn't pan out. I I think the coalition issue is one that uh, deserves a lot of attention significantly. The coalition piece that we think we have down now, and you consider a coalition, coalition doctrine, that there is not a very well advanced in World War One, and you don't see, for example, the Allies were really working together a team until what I taught students is told the Germans hold a gun to their head. Now, in the, the spring of 1918, the Germans create three massive breakthroughs on the Western Front, and the Allies see their backs being pushed up against the wall. Yeah, maybe we'd better have one 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 single commander on the Western Front. That's what it takes. To get a real coalition command, right. right? Absolutely. Well, um, anybody got any other burning thing we ought to let these folks hear on? Uh, this is one of the most important lessons. At the end of World War One, I, I try to make a transition for my students, and it's an essay we don't use anymore. But it's Lawrence of Arabia's first essay that he wrote in uh, London when he got back from the desert in uh, 1918. And he said uh, when he was out leading the Arab armies, he, uh, he led an army into the field, and it was routed by the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire. And he realized that he could not fight against the uh, Central Powers in a conventional manner. That the Ottoman Empire, what we would know today as Turkey, not that much larger, but used conscription, had modern weapons, and it had a general staff that sent hundreds of thousands of men out on railroads to uh, exert force throughout it, throughout the Mideast. And Lawrence said, I could not stand up and fight this machine and these institutions. But 
this and what what appeared to be an enormously powerful machine actually had weaknesses because they had to get where they were going on railroads and he suggested that by using small groups of raiders to attack the railroad lines he could negate the enormous power of that empire its general staff um in its entire uh, synchronization what's the significance of that chain well, maybe somewhere along the line, the relationship between man and machine starts to change and morph. And I don't know how far along that course we are today. Something to think about. Phil, so, absolutely. All right. Well, a few pointers on some ways to explore the issues of World War One. Thank you very much. You have just heard, an edited discussion from 1999, on the First World War from a military perspective. The event took place at the Combat Studies Institute in the United States. We willed it not. Wake up, England! Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. This is HistoryRadio.org, a free educational radio stream, remembering the First World War.